Good day, everyone. My name is Tom Rieger to welcome you to our research synopsis here from, uh, within a presentation we're calling What is Digital Transformation? The Research. My name is Tom Rieger. I'm Chief Strategy Officer at Neocol Corporation, and I'm here with Lane Severson, Partner Executive with DocuLabs Corporation in Chicago, Illinois. Let's start with the premise of this conversation. I know when Lane and I have worked together for a long time, and we were talking here a few months back around this thing called digital transformation, and there is a lot going on out there from a no noise and news perspective. And we wanted to start a research effort in surveying the market and, and, and validating what is going on out there. So here's what we think it is. First of all, the term is abstract at best. In fact, even if you go to Wikipedia and look at the definition of digital transformation, for those of you who see it here on the screen, I can't think of any more abstract way of describing something. Digital technology in all aspects of human society. But it is a business problem. It is, sadly, broadly technical. Uh, I would love to think it's a business problem that could be solved by business people, but technology has very much a hand in this. What we have seen is it is about the customer. And it's about bringing a nimbleness and less complexity in the context of the customer. But to really get to the bottom of it, if you go out to Google right now and you do a Google search on digital transformation, there's over 12 million page hits that you get in what digital transformation is. What it is not is one thing to all people. In fact, I would bet the reason we are all either on this webcast or watching the recording is because we, you, are trying to get to the bottom of what this means to you and your organization. And it is not coming up with a different version of the status quo. It is not unique to one industry. This is not being driven by regulations or competition or something that is unique to one industry. It is crossing industry boundaries. And it is not taking something old and calling it new. It's worth noting too, especially as we, you see within the research, that there is a mix of both technical and relatively non-technical people who are involved in this research, who are here with us on the webcast, and who may watch this recording. And it's worth noting that there is a degree from a technology perspective that's worth walking through here. Firstly, there's this thing called Moore's Law. Moore, Gordon Moore was the co, one of the co-founders of Intel over 50 years ago. And he stated how that the evolution of, of technology, of the microchip, over time will double in performance every 18 months. And how that has evolved over time from an economics perspective is basically you get twice as much for half the price every 18 months. Now let's fast forward this into today. So the drawing above is looking at different technologies over the last hundred or so years and what the calculations per second were based on a constant dollar. So you see here a pretty much a linear line in terms of processing. But if you look at it today, the latest Intel chip that can be put in a server has 28 processing cores inside that one chip and each of those cores can do two things at once. So you have over 50 parallel executions happening on a chip. Now what does this mean for the economics of computing? Well to co continue with this story you see where Amazon Web Services drops prices. We have a deflation going on in terms of what organizations are able to procure through cloud-based services. In fact, Jeff Barr, who's the chief evangelist officer of Amazon, announced in July there's 60 second price drop for something that you can subscribe to on Amazon. Lane, yeah, Tom, do you see I, in, in your I, world where this is affecting your clients? Yeah, I, I think you know one of the things that's interesting here is if you look at the economics around uh, Amazon and their AWS offering, 
um, you know, this continues to be one of their largest margin businesses, even though they're, you know, continually dropping the price on it. And, you know, the combination of the, the service that's being offered there, the flexibility around it and the pricing model are really, uh, you know, driving a lot of folks towards, uh, you know, using cloud computing and, you know, moving off of their on-premise uh, delivery. I know we've got folks on here from a, from a marketing standpoint, but, you know, this is, this is impacting uh, us both at the, the technology level of what we're able to stand up and how we're able to do it as well as how quickly we're able to serve clients and you know, scale up and down with the demand that we get depending on maybe seasonal variability or um, you know, offerings that we have out there uh, for our different businesses. Absolutely, Lane. And I, I felt that this was worthy to describe both from a history perspective where we're at and how this is affecting us from an economics perspective. In fact, something I was just researching before we came on the webcast is <clears throat> anybody who is an avid iPhone upgrader, it's worth noting that the latest iPhone with their A11 chip, that chip inside that phone has two primary processing cores or four other acceleration cores with a total of 4.3 billion transistors inside your iPhone. So it's just, you know, the, the mobility of all of this scale is also, you know, continuing to evolve as well. And again, when we came into this, we did a lot of pre-research on this front to get to the bottom of digital transformation and what it means. And we looked at press, we looked at news, you can see the different outlets here. And I know I personally started with an association that I've worked with over the years called AIM. AIM is the Association for Information and Image Management. And they had just completed a piece of research around digital transformation but it was, it was, again, coming at it from a very heavy technology perspective. And to put it in context, there were 625 references to the percentage of something in the paper. That's a lot to consume. We continued the journey as, I, as, as Lane and I went out there and looked in other places. And you see where the technology analysts, so for those of you, again, who are not in technology, the people like Gartner and IDC and Forrester do a lot of research every day in looking at technology, information technology and the like, and they've done a lot in what digital transformation is doing to the world, but not what it is. You then look at the, the technology press out there, and there's all kinds of different logos of websites you can go to in technology press, and you see a lot of uh, digital transformation in this company, digital transformation in this industry, but still not necessarily what it is. You see that the topic has tr transposed into the business world. So you see Forbes and Reuters, and even at the annual World Economic Forum, there are sessions focused on digital transformation. You also see either trade associations or specific vertical press doing write-ups uh, around digital transformations. So the American Marketing Association, the, the de facto standard in, in the, the marketing community, but also as you kind of pivot into those worlds, you don't think of much around technology, like Penn Energy is known as the largest publisher in the oil and gas industry, or the mining global, the act of extracting things out of the ground. They're writing about digital transformation. You see TED Talks on it. I mean, how many of us go out there and watch a TED Talk on YouTube, or I know I personally would put that on my bucket list to go see TED, is there are discussions around digital transformation. And where it really came home for me is when I was traveling a few weeks ago and I saw there was an article in USA Today titled, Digital Transformation, here it comes. Here what comes. But my favorite observation from a research perspective leading into this was how I can now have a skill on LinkedIn doing digital transformation. But what am I doing? Lane, do you have any other thoughts on what we went through up to this point to talk about this research at, a, at this level? Yeah, I, I think it was interesting to take a look at this and to see that, you know, there's a perspective around digital transformation um, from, like you mentioned, more of the technical side um, is, is one angle. Uh, so what are the new tools and capabilities that are available to the marketplace and how is that changing the way that we deliver solutions? Um, there's also the marketing side of it, you know, so how do I change um, the experience that my client has when they interact with one of my digital properties? How do I make sure that 
I'm interacting with them in the way that they want to be interacted with, whether that's, you know, a social media cha channel through the website and offering a consistent brand and message and um, ability to, to work together. You know, T-Mobile has been a leader here and um, actively, you know, providing cross-channel chat and you can interact with them through a variety of methods, really interesting stuff. But then you also have the back-end operational side of what's going on where energy organizations and mining organizations are looking at increased use of mobile, video, and digital content for tasks like repairing heavy, um, you know, having heavy manufacturing artifacts and monitoring the grid and, you know, using the Internet of Things to make sure that we're providing consistent, reliable and safe energy and usage across their networks. And so it's, it's really fascinating to see the different perspectives on this issue. Absolutely. And I want to highlight one last thing, too, where as I think we've all either seen on a TV show or read in a book, or you see an investigation of corruption or something, and they say make reference to uh, uh, um, follow the money. It's worth noting the last bullet here is if you watch where capital is being placed, it is being placed in companies that are here to drive the transformation in the technology world. And where this really came to, to a head for me, and in fact, this is when Lane and I decided to start this research, is when I found this article on LinkedIn written by the president and CEO of Fifth Third Bank. Please note, I created a bit.ly here in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen so you can go read the entire article yourself. But he starts by saying the following, customers embrace technology and their expectations are rapidly evolving. They want to bank anywhere, anytime, and they compare their bank experience to their last best digital experience, not to experiences with other banks. I thought this was a very powerful quote. It isn't just the fact that it was the CEO of a company who wrote this in great detail, but it was the fact that it came from what I consider a conservative Midwest financial entity who is expressing this need for change and this need that he sees from their clients going forward. And that is the beginning of the paper. How he ends it, I think, is a very powerful ending as well, where he states, the only question is whether we shrink from it, ignore it, or embrace it. And if you look at some of the measures that came out of this write-up, it gives you some perspective of even as a banking entity, where they're seeing the shifts from their customers. And you notice that every shift has to do with technology. Lane, do you have any take on this? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the, in, the, in the banking world, there was a lot of angst after, uh, you know, PayPal came in and took up a lot of the, the transaction work that they were doing. And um, I know from, you know, being at a lot of the American banker meetings back then that, you know, they're kind of bemoaning that, you know, similar to today, there's angst around, you know, organizations like mint.com that are taking away the front end view uh, of the client and offering a view across multiple products and multiple different organizations. And so banks are really struggling with, you know, how do we continue to be the frontline representative of our own products and our own services, um, you know, to our clients. And you can tell again, by following the money, if you look at organizations like, you know, J.P. Morgan Chase or Bank of America, nearly 50% of their spend and their employees are in information technology. And, you know, um, Bank of or uh, J.P.M. Chase has recently said, you know, they think of themselves as a digital company, as a technology company that is offering financial services products. And so there's definitely a shift in you know, how do we bring our products to market and how do we serve our clients directly in this place, um, even from, as you mentioned, a conservative industry like banking financial services? Absolutely. And if you even think about how General Motors opened up a technology arm in Austin, Texas, or but how, as I read Consumer Report, one of the latest additions that came into my mailbox had to do with comparing and contrasting what the digital experience was in automobiles, in their infotainment systems. 
it's turning into where everything has to do with technology and it has to do with the customer. We have a hypothesis and a method we wanted to go through here. But the first one is, I think we all agree that digital transformation is about a customer experience. That it is about being smarter digitally. I do not want to think that the billions and billions of dollars spent up to now on computing from an IT perspective and how what we have on our hands and what we have running in our homes is all rubbish. But what we need to do is to do things smarter, to be more integrated, to take the menial and manual out of a lot that takes place inside of an entity today. And that happens for a lot of reasons. Make the research applicable again, as we found, to both the technology-centric individuals and the non-technology-centric individuals, like a fair number of the folks are on this webcast today. And finally, questions about the current perceptions and the future because the future of technology is only as much as what we believe that is possible today. So of the 150 completed responses, I wanted to slice and dice into uh, the folks that responded. So it's worth noting that some of the people who completed the survey came to the webcast today, but a lot of you did not take the survey yourself. It's worth noting that fully three-fourths of the people who completed this research effort were not IT people. In fact, over half of them were in marketing. And we'll talk about that a little bit more here in a minute. Secondly, the size of the organizations covered the spectrum. In fact, if you heat map what we had for responses based on organizational sizes when it comes to the number of employees, this actually maps very, uh, very well into the economy. Thirdly, if you look at it by industry, it's worth noting that from these survey results, we had a lot of computer software and services organizations who completed the survey, but a lot of that has to do with also where you see a lot of hyper-competitiveness from both a marketing perspective and a customer retention perspective. And Lane, you had mentioned a few other insights before we got in this call as well that I, I wanted to give you a chance to highlight. Yeah, so I, I think if you look at the major industries here, Tom, you've got, as you mentioned, computer and software services, advertising and marketing, manufacturing, and even uh, higher ed there. Um, if you think about the, the demographics of the customers that they're serving, in general, these are organizations uh, that, you know, have an appeal to uh, a clientele that's, you know, demographically below or at 18. And so as you start thinking about, you know, getting into college or consumable goods or, you know, uh, advertising and marketing, there's there is definitely an expectation from that consumer group that is uh, more advanced than perhaps, um, you know, uh, older generations. And I think that maybe that might be part of the drive here for why we see uh, banking, financial services, and, you know, utilities, which are uh, less on the spectrum for somebody early in their life. We do see a push in um, kind of a non-customer facing sense from those types of organizations. Take utilities for an example. If you look at the current metrics for utilities and the average age of their employees, um, they really do face a white tsunami. And so they, they have over 75% of current employees for utilities across America are currently eligible for retirement. And these organizations are attempting to find how do we engage with potential future workers in a way where they can apply for, get jobs, and um, you know, work at a place that is considered uh, digitally active, even if the services to their customers are less dependent upon that. And finally, the, the third slice is the seniority of the individuals who took the survey. Fully half of them were within the executive ranks or vice president or above, and two-thirds were direct level or above. So it, it brought a very decision-making level or very senior level engagement to the conversation when it comes to the output of the survey. So our first question we asked is just like their fifth third quote that I stated earlier, where do the customers compare you to their last best digital experience? And fully, 94% of the people said some of the time, or in this case, almost 6% said all of the time. But, and, and what I would state that, of the people who said they're rarely or not um, compared to customers, those were also all B2B center companies. They do businesses with other businesses. But in saying that, I would like to open up a quick uh, poll for everyone 
to give me your perspective on do your customers compare you to their last best digital experience? Are you being compared to Amazon or Netflix? A quick anecdote in here, Tom, while folks are finishing up. I had a conversation with a national PNC uh, provider recently, property and casualty insurance, and one of the big concerns that they had was what does the Amazon Echo and the way that folks are interacting with, you know, in-home devices like the Echo or, um, you know, Google and Apple's devices like that, how do we now communicate with our clients in a different way? And they understand that these products and these services from Google and Amazon have a direct impact on the way that they serve clients with their insurance products. Yes. So uh, I closed the poll and shared it back with everyone. Fully 75% of you feel that some or all of the time this applies to you, and 20% of you are honestly not sure. So this is where we have a very interesting polarizing question around the competitiveness of an organization in using technology to better service customers. And again, as I mentioned, a third of the folks stated we rarely do it, um, and there's a lot of room for improvement or how I had 5% who thought even less of their ability to service clients um, better with technology. It's worth noting too, and again, the, the beauty of when you have a survey is where do you find correlations amongst questions? That the people who said they were great or didn't do it well at all were the folks who were in kind of the managers or specialist level in the survey. So that means that executives as a whole felt that there was some of the time we do it well and or there's room for improvement. Now, I would like to ask the next polling question, which I think is very applicable to this audience, is how do you think you compare to your competition? Do you think you're great some of the time? Rarely? Nope. Or honestly, I'm not sure. Would love your take on this topic as well. All right. The poll is closed. Let's share the results. 81% uh, of you said we are great at it or do it some of the times, and there's some who aren't sure. Where we asked next was, now that we have an idea of perspective, now the question is, how often are customer documents received by each of these mediums? And we asked about portals, emails with attachments, faxes, and then through the traditional mail. Nine out of the 10 of the respondents state that we get emails with attachments all of the time or some of the time. That one really took me back because I think about the occasions where someone is having to attach something to an email and send it in as a communication. Over 60% over of the people said they go to some customer portal, they have a customer portal. You have almost half of the respondents talking about mail and then you have over 25% who are still receiving faxes some of the time or all of the time. Lane, are you seeing this trend within your clients as well? Yeah, and you know, just to, to add a little context around why we asked this question maybe and then a, a thought on it, I think that you know, we, we all acknowledge that the one-way communication of the development of what we put on our websites, what we send out in an email blast, how we put together a campaign, that there are definitely challenges there, but I think that there are challenges that have been, you know, are being identified and are, are being actively worked on. Um, it, it's really where we come into this area of two-way customer communication, where we need to receive information back from a client to either, um, you know, begin an onboarding process or to service an account. And what stood out to me here was I, I was surprised by the number of folks that are receiving documents through email attachments the clients I'm working with, I would say that that number is a little bit lower and that they're working to actually bring it up. I think that the golden mean, what we're all shooting for, is that folks will eventually not be providing us as much documentation at all, but will be entering information through uh, an e-form or some sort of direct mode like that through the customer portal. And if I had to guess, I, I would say that more of these folks are receiving information via fax than they would like to admit. That ends up when, you know, when we dig into a client, we take a look at their environment, that ends up being a little bit more of a dirty secret than folks like to admit. And so my guess is that there's more facts out there today still than, than folks either know or, or want to admit. However you want to take it, 
there are vast majority uh, or a vast uh, quantity of different ways that we're getting information from clients. And, you know, that causes some trouble with the way that we manage it, the way that we process it, and the way that we get business done after folks leave that digital experience. And, and we have to get to the hard work of dealing with these manual objects now. Our next question then had to do with, do you have a document management system that helps you better service your customers and all the documents associated with that? This is where it got a little lumpier. In fact, it was it's almost straight across the board from one extreme where I have yes, and it's integrated with our CRM system like a Salesforce.com or Microsoft Dynamics, or yes, but it's not well integrated. It's worth noting too, as we think about the size of an organization and how that plays into this is, those organizations that generally had a CRM system where all of this customer communications were well uh, integrated were on the, the lower end of the size of organizations where it got more complicated were because of organizations being larger. You'd rather be through mergers and acquisitions or divisional decisions to do things certain ways. Yeah, and I think that there's an important distinction to make there too, Tom, of the type of customer documents that we're talking about. I think that you know organizations struggle both with managing the, the documents that they receive from a client as they are opening up an account or servicing an account, as well as knowing which documents that they sent to a client, regardless of the channel. If you think about an example of somebody receiving a explanation of benefits from their insurance provider, calling into customer service, and that customer service person needing to find the right explanation of benefits to be able to explain it to them, even knowing you know, what documentation we've given to a client is difficult and tying both of those types of communications back and forth to a CRM has it's proved to be a struggle for a lot of folks. Well, now I wanted to take a quick moment and I couldn't think of a better visual way of doing this, but I, I will try my best where I, the what the communications were versus how well an organization managed those communications. Take a way to average of looking at this, you see where these folks that had well integrated CRM systems had a mix of communications coming in the door, but where this really becomes a little more complicated is if I look at no matter how well they're managing customer communications and the integrations of that, there's still this multi-channels coming in the door and it doesn't change too much. And then my favorite one, because I don't know about you, Lane, but the last time I had to sign mortgage paperwork, it was amazing to me how many more times I had to sign paper to get that mortgage done. And I just have to pick on that example. Anyone in mortgage banking on this webcast listen to the recording, my apologies. But are there still instances in your organization where a physical signature is required by customers on documents? And if I think about a keep bringing together the all the time and some of the times because even if it's some of the times you need to manage that signed document that represents 65 percent of the respondents and Lane I, I know there is all kinds of technologies out there but do you have any opinions on why the the pen on paper is still such a ubiquitous uh, requirement yeah I think so in my opinion the organizations we've seen move aggressively towards electronic signature are the ones where the business has said that they are going to accept perhaps a little bit more risk on their part because anytime you send a, you know request a compliance to say we want to change a physical signature to an electronic signature their advice is going to be well the safest thing to do is to keep it physical signature but Organizations that are moving forward with e-signature, I had a, a client tell me recently that he had a compliance person tell him to stick with physical signature, and he said, well, I just asked a different compliance person at that point. And <laughs> yes. it, it, it's humorous, but it's also, you know, there's a moving of the needle here where I think that businesses that are getting more aggressive with this are saying, we think that this is just as good as the physical signature, and in every instance where we can push that needle, we're going to. And that's been a big driver. Absolutely. And, and I still think the number of occasions where there are moments where we're trying to drive for better customer experience and how to make our customers happier versus that balance of just managing the perception of risk and liability. Yep. Only so, if you sign in black ink, Tom. Well, and this is where and this is where I created this slide too, because I have vivid memories of when I refied my mortgage recently and they made me sign things in blue. 
And when I signed something in a black pen, they had to go print it out again for me to use a blue pen. Last polling question for everyone. Are there instances where physical signatures are required on documents in engaging with a client, in making them a customer, in keeping them as a customer, if something changes about them as a customer? And mind you, when I say customer, it could be your organization working with consumers or your organization working with other businesses. It is interesting how amongst on the phone call here, 76% of you have some or all of the time where there is a need for ink on paper. Now let's think about the computing side of all of this. So there is this thing called cloud computing. And I say it this way because I still feel in 2017, if I ask each of you individually on the webcast what you think cloud means, I'm going to get a lot of different answers. But in our survey, we wanted to ask, and there is a very important word in this question I'm going to highlight, does your organization use cloud-based technology solutions in running your business operations and store your important, important information? Because cloud has been out there a long time for us to share, to use for, let's call it non-important services or it's been very transparent to us in how it's been used. Where now we're seeing enterprise information in the cloud. And you notice here that 80% of the respondents are now active or moving to enterprise critical systems in the cloud. Yeah, to this point, you know, we did a survey uh, at DocuLabs this spring with a variety of our financial services, insurance, and banking clients. And across the board, all of them told us that they are moving critical business processes to the cloud, that they no longer have concerns about the security around them, and that they believe they can deal with regulated information just as well in, in cloud platforms as they can on-prem. And that, that's a question where if you would have asked it two or three years ago, we would have received almost exactly the opposite answer. And so there's been a big sea change here. Yes, and I think it comes back again to the level of security that is now uh, implemented as part of cloud computing from a uh, concern perspective, but also it comes back to the economics. The economics of cloud are now making this more and more uh, consumable. So there were three particular sub-questions I like that we did on the survey as well, because I think they apply to all of us in some fashion, is the uses of cloud technology. How many folks use some sort of sync and share tool, like a box, how many folks use cloud-based office productivity products? That's a very long, complex way of saying Microsoft Office, Google Suite, Outlook, you know, some sort of email or office productivity tool set. And then, especially those who may know this answer, is how many folks are using some sort of platform as a service? Of all the people who are non-IT, how many of them actually had an opinion or knew these answers? because only 6% said they honestly did not know, but everyone else kind of knew the answers to all these questions. Do you feel, Lane, that has to do with the fact that this idea of digital and cloud is becoming a ubiquitous business you know, conversation? Yeah, I think so. I think there's two drivers behind it. One is organizations like uh, Adobe, which we don't have on here, but is you know a premier provider of marketing content management services, has gone all in on the cloud and made that their first delivery mechanism over the past couple of years. And so we've gotten really comfortable with tools like Salesforce.com, with Workday, with Adobe, and using uh, cloud environments for these types of transactions. I think on the other side, organizations are, are beginning to realize that it doesn't matter if you are a $10 billion company or a $10 million company, you're just as vulnerable to outside uh, threat and attack on your network and nobody can afford to spend as much money as Microsoft and Amazon and on their infrastructure. And so then it just becomes a question of, well, how do we negotiate and manage this? I think those questions around security and the questions around the availability of uh, high performance products have both been answered and that's, got a, that's a big push for most organizations. All right, we're coming down to the wire. We have a couple of last charts here. This is, in fact, I think this is one of our last ones. And this is now looking at, so as we've talked about so far, the perceptions of what's going on from the market, the perceptions of how you think your organization is doing, your take on the utilization of, of different uh, of technologies and how well they're integrated. And one of our last questions is, 
there's a kind of a level of adoption when it comes to some of these new, uh, let's call it buzzword bingo of digital transformation, some of these other terms. And Lane, would you like to talk about this a little bit more? Yeah, so uh, you know, a couple items that jumped out at me on here. I think obviously we're going to see growth in that customer portal area and increased self-service for clients across the board. That's something we hear about all the time, and we, we already see that it's pretty high around the 70% marker there. I think it is interesting when we say something like document scanning, most folks think about getting rid of actual paper documents sitting in a file cabinet in an organization and think, okay, well, you know, if we don't have that, then maybe we don't need this technology. But remember, even if you have uh, documents that are in a TIFF image or a, a you know, a, a, another file uh, like that, that getting the data out of them and transforming them into a real digital object is still going to take, you know, scanning and ingestion technologies. And so I think there will actually be uh, continued increase in that area. The, the last thing that jumps out at me here is. I think in this artificial intelligence and machine learning space, there's still a lot of confusion around what these capabilities are. I think in uh, the folks saying that they're already doing it, it's probably in some pretty limited use cases, some proof of concepts and just trying it out. But that's, a, that's an area of the world that is definitely going to mature and cause a lot of disruption not only around technology and how we serve clients, but also in you know how we manage our physical workforce and who's actually doing the work as a human being versus watching the robots. <laughs> it's, it's interesting when I think about robotic processing, bots, net bots. Again, we have this buzzword bingo of things that kind of fit under this umbrella we call digital transformation that is as much adding confusion to the conversation as taking it away. Lane, what is your take? Yep especially as you, you work with some of the, the, the bigger, more complex clients in the world, as you think about from this research and, and what we've done so far, what you would define as a leaguered versus a laggard. And I, I think it's important to point out here before I, I dive into some of the detail on this slide, that when we look at digital transformation, there's definitely a split between the work that's being done by what I would call the marketing and sales front of an organization and the way that we provide a good customer experience and standardize the, the digital environment, uh, all those good things that we talked about earlier on the call, and then really being able to find the ROI by digitally transforming the processes that sit behind everything from actually producing the content that goes on those uh, environments all the way through actually onboarding and serving clients. And for a lot of organizations, the leaders are ones that have not just focused on making a prettier website, but are actually trying to figure out how do we do our business of serving the client, of producing product, of maintaining um, infrastructures better through the use of these technologies. And so a lot of the leaders in the space are identifying places where they are still using things like physical signature or fax or where they don't have the capability to onboard a client through a web or mobile channel. And they're setting strategic dates and you know initiatives in their roadmap to get those projects done. I think you know, some of the laggards in this space, they realize that this is going on. They're attempting to do something about it. And a lot of them, as we saw in the survey, are purchasing cloud-based tools. They are using the best and brightest technology that's out there. But for a lot of them, they're not evaluating the manual paper-based processes that brought them to where they are. Essentially what they're doing is continuing to do the work that they did yesteryear, which demanded a paper-based process, except now they're doing it in a digital environment. For these folks, it's really important that they take a step back and try to reimagine how would we do this work if we just started with the tools that were able to be used today and we just wiped the slate clean on some of these old-fashioned processes. That's a big aha moment for a lot of organizations. I want to highlight, too, one of the things of modern computing today is the opportunity for any sized organization, no matter how big you are, to take advantage of that which traditionally would have had to have been backed up in a truck, unloaded, and loaded into a large complex data center that had a lot of complex capital purchases. Today you can subscribe to so many things. I describe it as like being I could be a, I could go build homes and never have to buy a lick of equipment because I could go rent it and use it on demand. 
you have that same on-demand capability now within cloud computing to create amazing experiences for clients that in a lot of cases could flank your competition who could be much, much bigger than you because you now have a nimbleness into what you're up to. Yeah, so, so some of the, the to, to wrap this up and take a look at, you know, what does it mean? I, I do think that, you know, digital transformation is a moniker, is a name that has generally been taken over uh, by marketing initiatives. And when I talk to folks that are on the back end and are supporting those initiatives or supporting the work that comes out of those initiatives, they don't see their work as being part of digital transformation uh, nearly as much. And so I think that there's a real opportunity for organizations to get a, a hard ROI on reducing their cost per transaction, reducing their cost to deliver product by expanding the scope of digital transformation across the board in their organization. You know, transferring legacy paper-based processes to a digital environment, that's not what we're trying to do here. And it, it really is hard work to step back from a process or a way that we've done things for you know 10 or 20 years and think about how do we do this differently. If you look at the industry, a lot of folks in leadership positions across different business types are leaving large, well-established organizations like a Bank of America or a JPM Chase and going off to start a fintech company. And they mention in their interviews precisely that they wanted that opportunity to start over from nothing and to rethink the process. And I think that that's a challenge for all of us today. And again, I think part of what drove a lot of people from the line of business, especially marketing, to be involved in this research and to attend this webcast today is because marketing has that responsibility of finding the next customer and retaining the current customers. And if digital transformation is about creating a better customer experience, that is where it becomes this new relationship that needs to come from the marketing organization and helping transform how the business operates to find and retain those customers. I'd like to close it out and really getting to the to in some cases the point of what it is because we've we've spoken about the term a lot in this presentation. We've shared some observations in this presentation but I think from both a, a, a line of business perspective and from an IT technology perspective we need to kind of really bring it home is what is the impact or what is digital transformation and it was always that you have Black Friday. And Black Friday was when a retailer had this explosion in orders, how they needed to have all the right people and have all the right infrastructure in place to handle this very short window of explosive sales because that would define their ability to exist as a retailer. And I think in modern terms, the cloud and what we expect from being able to have the right infrastructure digitally to transform is to have our own versions of elasticity, that ability to grow and shrink as our business sees fit. Secondly, it's our ability to adjust to our business. Now, who on this call 90 days ago would have ever thought that Amazon would buy Whole Foods? And what has that done to people in the grocery market in terms of now thinking how they need to adjust to a changing business environment? And are they now a slave to their limits of technology or are they empowered to service clients in this new reality? Thirdly, we have security and governance. The world is more complicated today. For a long time, we worried about things like governance and lawyers and discovery and lawsuits as things to worry about. Where today, we worry about hackers and, and personal identification and personal health records and personal credit records, no matter what, it's still that need to ratchet down what you need to do from a security, governance, risk, and compliance perspective in this new world of supposedly openly using digital technology to better engage our customers. We need to have this agility. So in the last five years, there's a technology term called SMAC, Social, Mobile, Analytics, and Cloud. It's like the four-legged of buzzword bingo in high-tech marketing, but it's also where we've all moved to in terms of how we engage. We engage through Twitter and LinkedIn. We engage through our mobile devices. 
we are all trying to be smarter analytically and understanding our business. And finally, having this thing called cloud as being this more nimble way of using technology compared to not being limited to, and my apologies for acronyms, end of service or end of life technology inside my IT shop or this slave of having to upgrade things all the time. And next thing you know, a great majority of your IT budget is being spent to maintain the status quo that is keeping you from evolving versus having a greater agility using the next technology. Next down the list is we need to be able to use technology as we can consume technology. Traditionally, people would spend millions of dollars and back up the truck and load up big machines and they would, they would flood the hallways with new capabilities. And we would have executive sponsors and it would become complicated. Where today, we want to be able to have technology that is consumable, that we turn on when it makes sense, that we have areas in best in breed that come about to bring what's best based on what is available today and where it's going tomorrow. There is a lot of risk in buying and implementing complex technology, and that has not gone away. That has been around since I first got out of college. Everyone wants to be able to have this ability to quickly decide if something will work. How do I take the risk out of success? And how do I only pay for what I'm using? Risk, pay, success. And my ability to go live, my time to market, now measured by a stopwatch and not a calendar. And we've talked about this a lot, but we want to have a better customer experience, but we also need to have a better employee experience by removing the manual and menial efforts. How often in your organization, and, and if anyone happens to email me with a laugh over this when you hang up the phone, how many on the phone, people on the phone, have somebody that has to go print something out off of one system to take it over to another one to scan it back in to an imaging system? How do we reduce that manual effort of printing and scanning, copy and paste, and create a, a systems that are, that are easy to understand that create happier customers. And then finally, fits into your existing environment. Because all of this sounds very pie in the sky if we do not respect that there are trillions of dollars spent on existing systems that need to be maintained and loved and augmented in some cases, or surrounded with these newer technologies to bring forth a better outcome down the road. So that is our take on what it is. It is not one answer. It is not a yes or no. It is a conglomeration of a multi-legged stool that if a couple of these legs are missing, the stool doesn't stay up. So with that being said, if you think any of these things apply to you, or if you have an aha moment that came about from this presentation, we would like to have an impromptu conversation between ourselves to understand how we may be able to help you scope how you can do your own transformation, how you can create your own initial success. So our email information is there on the screen. You can also expect to see a more formal white paper of this research, including greater details that were not shared today, as a white paper that will complete it, be completed by the end of the month. Do you have any final words yourself, Lane, you'd like to share with the audience? You know, I, as I think about this space, I think there's a lot of new technologies that are out there. There's an explosion of capabilities, and folks have a lot of strategic questions sitting in front of them. And so really thinking through, you know, how are we going to move quickly, but also in a way that we're not going to get ourselves stuck in the future is a challenge a lot of folks have. And so it's not just about technology, um, even though a lot of this is focused around that. It really is about making those strategic decisions and, you know, sticking to the game plan over the long run.